Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. My quarantine hair would like to welcome you to the 40th lecture of ECE 3084 Signals and Systems. So we have been spending a ton of time solving differential equations subject to various initial conditions using Laplace transform methods. And this is very much like what you've probably already done a lot of in your sophomore differential equations class. Now, there are some rather villainous math professors out there who actively refuse to use any Laplace transform methods over the course of their differential equations class. And they do this just to mess with the engineering students. And those professors should reevaluate their roles as educators. So we've been solving specific differential equations with terms on the right-hand side that we've been imagining are specific inputs to some system where the output of that system is represented with the variable y. Here, I'm doing something much more general. Besides providing these generic constants instead of specific numbers, I'm also not giving you what these specific initial conditions are. They're just kind of whatever. We'll leave those generic as well because most of what we're going to be doing for the rest of the class isn't looking at the output of a specific differential equation for some specific input and some specific initial condition. What we'll want to do is look at the overall structure of a system and then analyzing that structure to see how the system will respond to general classes of inputs. So let me do the usual thing of taking the Laplace transform of both sides. For the second derivative, I'm going to need both pre-initial conditions. Uh, for the first derivative term, I'll just need the pre-initial condition for y itself. And now I'll have just the Laplace transform itself. Now there's an important point I want to make, and this is why I've always been so insistent about putting these superscript minus signs. In the broader context in which we're analyzing these kinds of equations, we always assume that our pre-initial conditions on our inputs are zero. So if the term up there included a double derivative term, then I would also have a pre-initial condition on the derivative of the input, and that would be zero. And similarly, all the way up the line, however many dots you want to put on the x, we're always assuming that they're zero. So the inputs are always instant on inputs. This is a really important distinction to make because you can get into all kinds of confusion if you say things like the input x of t is cosine t u t. And we've defined the unit step function at zero as being one. So if you're trying to use Laplace transform techniques on the right hand side here and you're looking at that x dot term, well, if you don't make this distinction about these being pre-initial conditions, then you might write something like this. You would just stick in a zero without the little minus, you would say this is cosine zero and u zero. Both of these are one and you get one. And then when you deal with the right hand side here, you would say, oh, well, I need to subtract that initial condition. So I'll put one in here over the course of writing that expression. And that's what you don't want to do because the pre-initial condition here, this guy is really zero. Okay, rant concluded. So this is something that most textbooks are fairly sloppy about. And I usually try to avoid sticky technical details like this, but this is a place where it's really important to get that particular detail correct. Okay, so with this fairly important assumption on the pre-initial conditions of the input, on the right-hand side we have B1, S, B0. Okay, so at this point you know the drill. I'm going to factor out the capital Y S and we're going to move everything having to do with the initial conditions over to the right hand side. And then I have the terms relating to the input that were already on the right hand side. Now I can get Y of S by itself by dividing both sides of the expression by S squared plus A one S plus A naught. And the way I'm going to write this is I'm going to put the big X of S over here. And the reason I want to do that is I want to put a big box around all of this stuff multiplying big X of S, and I want to call it something. I want to call it big H of S, and I want to call it either a transfer function, which I think is the most common term, or I want to call it a system function, which is the kind of term that the ECE 2026 textbook uses. So inverting the Laplace transform, we could say that our time domain output consists of two terms. 
One of them we can call the natural response, and the other we can call the forced response. We've also referred to the forced response as the zero state, or I like to say the zero initial condition response. So this is what you get if you have zero initial conditions, but you have some kind of input going into the system. Whereas the natural response, we can think of that as the zero input response. So we've been using the term zero input response as synonymous with natural response, and the term zero state or zero initial condition response as synonymous with forced response. Lately, I've been going through my giant stack of signals and systems books, and although quite a few of them use these terms interchangeably in the way I've just described, I have seen a few that actually define zero input and natural response as being different. And then they'll also describe zero state and forced as being different, having to do with the fundamental modes of the system, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But for this course, I'm going to continue with the convention of using these terms synonymously and these terms synonymously. So conveniently, the Laplace transform of the forced response, the way we've defined it, looks like the Laplace transform of the input times the transfer function. And remembering a convenient property of Laplace transforms, we can say that this forced response is equal to the input convolved with the impulse response. So big H of S, this transfer function or system function, whatever you want to call it, is the Laplace transform of the impulse response of the system. We can learn a lot by looking at the transfer function of a system because we can completely define how the system responds to inputs with the transfer function, we could always go back and treat the initial conditions separately. But also, in this general context of dealing with linear time invariant systems that are defined by linear differential equations with constant coefficients, notice there is something in common here. The denominator of the transfer function matches the denominator of the zero input, aka natural response term, in the Laplace domain. So you can get a good amount of the qualitative feel of how a system is going to act based on looking at the denominator of the transfer function. For instance, this b sub 1 s term and this s times this pre-initial condition term, well, if you take the inverse Laplace transforms of these things, they're going to have a similar form. So in doing transfer function analysis, we assume that the initial conditions are zero, so we can get rid of all of that stuff. Nearly every time I've taught this class, I will have an exam question at some point having to do with transfer functions, and I won't say what the initial conditions are, and a student will raise their hand and ask, well, what are the initial conditions? And then I can't really say anything because part of the test is to see that they realize that transfer function analysis doesn't involve initial conditions. If there are some initial conditions, you treat those separately. So we started from a differential equation and wound up deriving the transfer function, but we should be able to go the other direction. If we start with the transfer function, we should be able to see that we could take the denominator here, put it over here on the other side by multiplying both the left and right side of the equations by the denominator, and then take the inverse Laplace transform of everything using the derivative formula. Now again, when we're talking about transfer function analysis, we're assuming the initial conditions are zero. And with a bit of practice, this does not take a whole lot of work. Suppose I had the transfer function 3s to the power of 4 minus 7s all over s to the 8 plus 4s to the 7 minus 2s squared plus 9. I just pick some numbers here at random. Okay, so you can imagine taking this denominator and putting it up on the other side here, and that would be the side corresponding with y. So writing out the actual differential equation, I'll have the eighth derivative of y. This is an alternative derivative notation that you really want to pull out once you go beyond three dots. Otherwise, sticking eight dots above the y gets a bit crazy. I would have 4y, 7th derivative. And here, putting two dots above the y isn't unreasonable. So instead of putting a 2 in parentheses like that, I'll just put two dots plus 9. And now, don't forget to put the y. If you just leave the 9 there, then that's wrong. 
I will often forget to put the Y there. Now on this side, we have the input, which is the X, and I'll put a four in parentheses here in the superscript to indicate a fourth derivative. And here again, putting one dot above the X isn't unreasonable. So instead of putting a one in parentheses in superscript, I'll just put that dot there. And I would like to remind you, we're not saying anything about initial conditions here. Transfer functions don't say anything about initial conditions. You have to treat those separately if they're not zero. And you should be able to go the other way, going from here, that direction. One last thing I want to mention that will occasionally trip students up is the way we've been writing differential equations has a different style than the way we wrote difference equations in the discrete time context in EC 2026. There we usually had y of n on the left-hand side, and then all of your x stuff was on the right-hand side, along with all of your other y stuff. So in that context, when we're talking about z transforms, and we had things in the numerator having to do with x, and things in the denominator having to do with y, there was a sign flip that came from moving things from one side of the equation to the other. We don't have any of that stuff here. That's not something that we're needing here in the continuous time context.